Welcome back! This is video number three in a series where we talk through our complete process for creating Ultimate Frisbee highlight videos. Check out the links in the description if you want to start from the start or jump to another video. In this video, we'll be talking through all of the different camera settings that we use to film Ultimate Frisbee. Before we get into things, I should mention that you can set your camera to auto mode and have it decide all of these settings for you. That can work pretty well depending on the camera, but for the cameras that we use, I like to have more control over the image, so I tend to adjust a lot of these settings manually. Like I say, that is just a preference, and you're welcome to do things differently. If auto settings on your camera give you good results, I would encourage you to use them. The other thing that I should mention before we start is that because we're discussing things from the ground up in this course, for each setting I'll first be explaining what it is and what it does, and then explaining what settings we use to get the results that we want. If you're already experienced in photography or videography, a lot of this will be pretty familiar to you, so you're welcome to watch as much or as little of this video as possible. The specific settings that we'll be talking about in this video are shutter speeds, aperture, ISO, picture style, white balance, frame rate, and sound recording level. If you already know what all of those settings are, jump to the end of the video for a quick wrap up of what settings we use. All right, if you're still here, that means that you're here for the full explanation. Let's get into it. The first settings that we need to discuss are shutter speed, aperture, and ISO. These are the bread and butter of photography and videography, so again, you might already be familiar with these settings. If you are, and you just want to know what settings we use, skip to this timestamp. To understand these settings, we need to understand a little about how a camera works under the hood. It's easiest if I explain these concepts in the context of taking photos, and then we'll relate that to videos later. To take a photo, a camera needs to capture light, and at the heart of each camera, there's a rectangular sensor that is sensitive to light. To get the light from the environment to the sensor, the light first enters the lens, which has a few glass elements to bend the light and also has a small hole in it that lets the light through. From there, a shutter, which is kind of like a set of curtains, opens and exposes the sensor to light for a short amount of time. The sensor then translates the light that it sees into digital information, which is processed by the camera, into an image. The settings that we're going to discuss here are shutter speed, which relates to, you guessed it, the shutter, aperture, which relates to that small hole in the lens, and ISO, which relates to how the sensor processes the image. Each of those three settings can be changed to make the image brighter or darker, and each of those settings also changes some other aspect of the image as well. And if things weren't complicated enough, all of these settings have at least two names. First is shutter speed. This tells you how long the camera shutter is open for, which controls the amount of light that hits the camera sensor. If the shutter is open for longer, more light can get through. Because of this, shutter speed is also referred to as exposure time or exposure, and it's measured in seconds or fractions of seconds. A slow shutter speed means that the sensor is exposed for more time, which means that more light hits the sensor and the image gets brighter. A faster shutter speed means less light hitting the sensor and a darker image. Because shutter speed controls how long the sensor is exposed for, it also controls the amount of motion blur in the image. This is what that looks like. This image was taken with a shutter speed of 1 over 10, which means that the light was hitting the sensor for 1 tenth of a second. The reason why the disc is so blurred in this image is because the disc was moving. When the shutter opened, the disc was here, and over the course of 1 tenth of a second, the disc moved like this until it ended up here, where the shutter closed. Compare that to this image. Here, the disc was moving at a similar speed, but the shutter speed for this image was 1 over 125. So over the course of 1 125th of a second, the disc moved from here to here. Because the shutter speed was quicker, there is less motion blur. If we lower the shutter speed enough, for example in this image, with a shutter speed of 1 over 1600, the disc is still moving at a similar speed, but because the shutter is so fast, there is very little motion blur. The next thing that we need to talk about is aperture. Remember that small hole in the lens that lets light through? That's called the aperture of the lens, and adjusting the aperture setting in your camera makes the hole get bigger or smaller. The setting that you can select on your camera is preceded by the letter F, so aperture is sometimes referred to as f-stop. As the number after the F gets smaller, the hole gets bigger. As with shutter speed, changing the aperture changes the amount of light hitting the sensor, and thus brightens or dims the image. A smaller number, say f3.5, means a larger hole, which means more light gets to the sensor and the image gets brighter. A bigger number, say f18, means a smaller hole, so less light gets to the sensor and the image gets darker. Because of some physics to do with the way that lenses work, changing the aperture also changes the depth of field, 
which is just a fancy way of saying how blurry the background is. So if you have a high F number, i.e. smaller hole, the background of your image will be more in focus, like in this image captured at F20. Compare that to this image, which was taken with a larger hole at F4, where the background is a lot more blurry. The last setting that we're talking about in this section is ISO. ISO is related to how your camera processes the signal from the sensor, and it's basically an amplification. In the same way that I can take an electric guitar and plug it into an amplifier to make it louder, I can adjust the ISO setting to apply some amplification and make the image brighter. So the bigger your ISO number gets, the more your camera is electronically brightening the image. Unfortunately, we can't get anything for free, so increasing the ISO also increases the amount of noise in an image. Now, noise isn't something that we normally associate with a still image, but in photography, noise refers to random fluctuations in pixel color or brightness. Let's take a look. Here's a photo taken with the lowest ISO setting on your camera, ISO 100. This just looks like a normal photo, and it's a relatively good representation of what was actually physically there in front of the camera. Compare that to this image, which was taken with an ISO of 25,600. If we zoom in here, we can see that there is a bunch of random rainbowish colors that weren't there in real life. Again, here's that same section of image taken at ISO 100. Okay, that was a lot of technical explanation. Hopefully that all makes sense. If you are new to these concepts, there is a lot of information to take in. I'm definitely not the first person to cover this topic on the internet, so if you still have questions or aren't sure of anything, I'd encourage you to look at some other photography tutorials online. There are people out there that can explain these concepts far better than I can. Time for a quick summary. Shutter speed, also called exposure time, is the amount of light that a sensor is exposed for. A slower shutter speed means a brighter image and more motion blur. Aperture, also called f-stop, is the size of the hole that lets the light through. A lower f number, aperture, means a wider hole which brightens the image and makes the background more blurry. ISO is an electronic brightening of the image, and a larger number means a brighter image, but also a noisier image. Now that we're clear on all that, we can finally talk about the settings that we use for filming. First, shutter speed. Because shutter speed changes how much motion blur each frame of video has, changing the shutter speed can make the footage look smooth if there's more motion blur, or choppy if there's less motion blur. A rule of thumb that I use is that the exposure time should be half of the time that each frame lasts for. For example, if we're shooting at 60 frames per second, each frame is displayed for 1 60th of a second, and so the exposure time should be half of that, 1 120th of a second. This generally means a good amount of motion blur. Next, aperture. Because Ultimate is generally a quick moving sport, it can be difficult to keep things in focus, even if you're using autofocus. One thing that we do to make this easier is we shoot at a relatively narrow aperture, which means that we get more of the image in focus. So generally we're somewhere around f9 to f14. That's definitely not the only way to do things though. If you want to capture highlights with sexy background blur, you need to shoot at a wider aperture. This makes it harder to keep the play in focus, but it looks great when you nail it. Lastly, ISO. Image noise looks bad and we generally want to avoid it as much as we can. So generally we try to keep the ISO setting as low as possible while maintaining a well exposed image that's not too bright or too dim. Speaking of too bright or too dim, while we're setting all of these settings we need to make sure that our image is correctly exposed. The way that we do that is first set the shutter speed to half of the frame duration. Then we set the ISO to the minimum value. After that we set our aperture to make sure that the image is correctly exposed. If that means that the aperture is too wide for my liking and I'm having trouble keeping things in focus, then I'll increase the ISO so that I can use a narrow aperture and keep the image exposed correctly. Making sure that our footage is correctly exposed sounds simple, but sometimes it can be really difficult. If I'm looking one way, filming one end zone and the sun is on my back, suddenly when I flip around to film the other end zone, I might be looking toward the sun and that image will look completely different and might require completely different settings to be exposed correctly. Ultimate Frisbee uniforms also tend to be bright or dark colours and it's not uncommon to have one team wearing completely white shirts and the other team wearing completely black shirts and that can be a nightmare for exposure. One thing that can help is if your camera has auto aperture or auto ISO settings, you can use those so that you don't have to manually adjust those settings. If you do want to use those, I'd recommend keeping an eye on what settings your camera is choosing just so that you don't get home to watch your footage and find that your camera chose some weird settings. One last thing before we move on. Because we're often filming outdoors, it can be hard to get accurate brightness information from the screen. 
If I'm filming with direct sunlight hitting my camera screen, to my eyes the image is going to look quite different to if I'm filming with the screen in the shade. Because of this, most cameras have a meter that you can use to ensure your image is bright enough. I'd strongly encourage you to use this because I have lost count of the times that I have shot something with the meter in the middle and I've looked at the screen and thought, no, 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 that's, that's not right. But then when I get back inside and watch the footage on my computer, it looks good because I used the meter. As well as making sure our image is exposed correctly, we also need to make sure that the colours look right. The two settings that we're going to talk about here are white balance and picture style. White balance is a setting that cameras use to ensure that the white colours in your image appear white on screen. Different sources of light can be slightly different colours. For example, compare these two desk lamps. These both emit quote unquote white light, whereas this one, with an incandescent bulb, emits light that is slightly yellow, and this one, with an LED bulb, emits light that is much more blue. When we're filming something, we want to make sure that the colours of the image are accurately represented regardless of what light we're using, and that the white balance setting that we use is the way to do that. What does that have to do with filming Ultimate, I hear you ask? Well, a good example would be if we're filming some Ultimate during the day, the field is lit by the sun. If we keep filming into the night and the sun sets and the field lights come on, chances are the light from those field lights could be a slightly different colour temperature to the light from our sun so the footage might look slightly different. We can account for that by setting the white balance setting correctly. Or you can do what we do, which is just to leave the white balance setting on auto. Generally, our cameras do a pretty good job of selecting the correct white balance, and if it gets it slightly wrong, I can correct it while I'm editing the video. The reason that I wanted to talk about white balance is that if you notice the colors in your image are not quite right, particularly if they're always slightly yellow or slightly blue, it could mean that your white balance setting is incorrect. The other color setting that we're going to talk about here is picture style. It's called picture style on Canon cameras, which is what we use, but it might be slightly different on other cameras. Basically, it's a collection of settings and presets that define what color effects are applied to the image. Typically, you can adjust the sharpness, contrast, saturation, and sometimes some other settings as well. Now, there are two schools of thought when it comes to setting these settings. You can either set the camera to generate good looking footage straight out of the camera or you can turn all of those settings down so that the camera isn't doing that much to the image and you can apply whatever effects you want later on while you're editing. The advantage of setting things up so the camera generates good looking footage is that it streamlines the video creation process because you don't have to go through later and edit the colors. The advantage of leaving things flatter or dialing back those settings and doing it yourself later is that theoretically the camera is capturing more information which gives you more freedom to make the footage look exactly how you want it when it comes to editing. Personally, I like to dial back the camera settings and edit the colors later myself. I like the control that it gives over the image, and sometimes it leaves me more room for error, allowing me to correct certain things that went wrong while filming. That is definitely not to say that's the best way to do things though. If you can get good results in camera, that will definitely make things quicker when it comes to editing. Before we wrap up, we need to talk about some video specific settings, namely resolution and frame rate. A video is basically just a series of images or frames that are being shown so quickly that our eyes perceive the image as moving rather than seeing a series of images. Resolution is the size of each frame, or more technically the number of pixels in each frame, and frame rate is the number of frames that are being shown every second. These two settings go hand in hand, and often to increase one setting we need to decrease the other setting. One really important aspect of filming Ultimate Frisbee highlight videos is using slow motion. Ultimate tends to happen quite quickly, and so being able to slow down the footage makes it easier to see what's going on. Plus, it also looks super cool. The way that slow motion works is we set the camera to film at a higher frame rate, and then we play back those frames at a lower frame rate. For example, if we shoot at 50 frames per second, and then play back those frames at 25 frames per second, each second of recorded footage will take two seconds to play back, so we'll be watching it at 50% speed. When we set up our camera, we need to decide what resolution and frame rate to record at, and often this is a balancing act. On the one hand, if you film at a high resolution, you can crop in while editing, which lets you fix any framing errors or make the subject better fill the frame. On the other hand, if you film at a higher frame rate, you can slow down your footage for slower slow motion. If you have a high-end camera that can do both, that's great, but if you have cameras like ours, chances are you'll need to choose a balance between the two. As a guide, I would recommend prioritizing at least half-time slow motion, which means it's shooting with a frame rate that is double the frame rate of your finished video.
After that, if you have the option, you can choose whether to increase your resolution or further increase your frame rate. Phew! That was a long video with a lot of camera settings. Let's do a quick fire summary of what settings we use to shoot our videos. Shutter speed should be set to double your frame rate. Aperture can either be set wider to blur the background or narrower to make it easy to keep the play in focus. ISO should be kept as low as possible, but can be used to brighten your image if you need it. We set our camera's white balance to auto, but if you're having color issues, you may need to set it manually. We use a picture style that doesn't do much to the image and we edit the colors later, but if you want to set up your camera to do the colors on the go, that's fine too. We try to balance a good resolution with a high frame rate and we recommend at least 50% slow motion. Now that we know how to use all these different camera settings, it's almost time to start filming some ultimate. But before we do that, there are a few other things that we need to do and that's what we'll be talking about in the next video. As always, don't forget to check out the links in the description for all the additional resources and addendums. And I'll see you in the next video where we'll be talking about getting organized before a day of filming.